track record of God has always been good. And that's what the Book of Wisdom says. It says that fear is the reason. You see the track record. You see, I, I show you a few instances today, how God has helped. Huh? If you could put on the board about that king, he has a long name, King Jehoshaphat. The lesson about King Jehoshaphat. This man was a godly king, but you know, a huge army came against him. A huge army, there was no way he could win. No way. And by the way, if you check up in history books, you will see there's a King Jehoshaphat there, which means these are not fairy stories. The Holy Spirit doesn't tell us fairy stories. These are historical events that took place. But the inner story behind this historical events is shown. The lesson about King George IV, okay? Very quickly, let us go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and show them verse number 2. Some messengers came and announced to King George IV, a large army from Edom has come from the other side of the Dead Sea to attack you. By the way, they have already captured Hazazon Tamar. So he receives the message. Show them verse number three, what happens? Jehoshaphat was frightened. He prayed to the Lord for guidance. He gave orders for a fast to be observed throughout the country. Irrespective of the religious things he did, the Bible is very frank. Put a round circle around the word frightened. See, he was frightened. But he directed his fear in the right way. How? He prayed. He gave orders for a fast to be observed throughout the country. Verse number four. From every city of Judah, people hurried to Jerusalem to ask the Lord for guidance. This is called channelizing your fear in the right way. And then we are told in verse number 14, the spirit of the Lord came upon a Levite who was present in the crowd. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. He was a member of the clan of Asaph, etc., 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 etc. The important part is the spirit of the Lord came upon one of them who was in the crowd. And show them verse number 15. Jehaziel said, Your Majesty and all your people of Judah and Jerusalem, the Lord says you must not be discouraged or be afraid to face this large army. The battle depends on God, not on you. Underline that last sentence. The battle depends on God, not on you. And this man is talking under the power of the Holy Spirit and he goes on. He goes on to say in verse number 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Just take up your position and wait. You will see the Lord give you victory. People of Judah and Jerusalem, do not hesitate or be afraid. Go out to battle. The Lord will be with you. All under the power of the Holy Spirit is talking. Verse number 20. Early the next morning, the people went out to the wild country near Tekoa. As they were starting out, Jehoshaphat addressed them with these words. People of Judah and Jerusalem, put your trust. Remember, he was frightened, first of all. But see, he's encouraging others. Put your trust in the Lord your God. You will stand your ground. Believe what his prophets tell you. Believe what his prophets tell you. Underline that word. This is what the Lord is saying to you today and to me today. Believe what is written in the Bible and you'll succeed. Believe that. And verse number 21 says, after consulting with the people, the king ordered some musicians to put on the robes they wore on sacred occasions to march ahead of the army singing. Praise the Lord. His love is eternal. I have never in my whole lifetime, and I bet with you, you also have never seen two armies confronting each other, but a band and a musical band playing in the middle of those two armies. I bet with you, you have never seen such a scene. But look what's this. Jehoshaphat's little army and a big army, and in between, they're praising the Lord. Huh? Verse number 22, show them. When they began to sing, 
the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. When they began to sing, the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. Verse number 23. The Ammonites and the Moabites attacked the Edomite army, completely destroyed it. Then they turned on each other in savage fighting. The enemy began fighting amongst themselves. And verse number 24. When the Judean army reached a tower that was in the desert, they looked towards the enemy and saw they were all lying on the ground dead. Not one had escaped. The Lord had prevailed. You understand now? You understand what I'm telling you this evening? Let the whole world be busy with their own work. Some watching TV, some playing cricket, some... But do you understand something here is being given much more precious? The lesson about King Jehoshaphat. So God's track record has been like this. Even in David's case, when they saw when they saw Goliath, they were really frightened. The Israelites show Goliath was a huge guy. Even nowadays, when we see a huge and tall person coming towards us, we get frightened. And we see the description of Goliath. If you show them in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 4, a man named Goliath from the city of Gath came out from the Philistine camp to challenge the Israelites. He was over nine feet tall. Can you imagine? I don't think even my ceiling is so high. He was taller than my ceiling. Yeah. Huh? Nine feet tall. Go on. Verse number five. He wore bronze armor that weighed 125 pounds. So as it is, he was huge plus the armor and a bronze helmet. Go on. Verse number six. His legs were protected by bronze armor. He carried a bronze javelin slung over his shoulder. Can you picture the sight? Verse number seven. His spear was as thick as the bar on a weaver's loom. Its iron head weighed about 15 pounds. A soldier walked in front of him carrying his shield. Almost like those uh, wrestling competitions, The Undertaker. One fellow walking in front and the big giant behind. Verse number eight. Goliath stood and shouted at the Israelites, What are you doing there? Line up for battle. I am a Philistine, you slaves of Saul. Choose one of your men to fight me. Now in this sentence, you take away the word Goliath. And you just put the name COVID. And you will see, COVID is nothing but another Goliath, which is making us, my God, this affected so many people, so many people dying. When it's going to affect my door, the neighbor has got it. Huh? Can you see that? Okay, verse number 11. When Saul and his men heard this, they were terrified. See the word, no? Huh? Just underline the word terrified. Fear gripped them, fear. And then, verse number 24. When the Israelites saw Goliath, they ran away in terror. Everyone was afraid. Just as today, you see, everyone is afraid of the new Goliath. Right? But David was different, 37 says, verse number 37. The Lord has saved me from lions and bears, the words of David. He will save me from this ministry. All right, Saul answered, go and the Lord be with you. Small little boy, David, he said, the Lord has saved me from lions and bears. What is this fellow for me? You all may get scared, but I will not get scared because of my, I know my God is bigger than this giant. I know my God is bigger than this COVID. And King Saul tried to help him. He said, you're going? Go, but wear my armor. At least you'll be protected. Huh? And he said, I can't wear your armor because, you know, I'm uncomfortable. We become uncomfortable in our reaction to problems using the same weapons that other people use because they don't believe in God. Or they believe, but only in theory. And look at verse number 39, verse number 39. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and tried to walk, but he could not. Because he was not used to wearing them. See, this is what we should be. We are not used to this way of the world of getting frightened and running and, you know, 
having panic in our chest. I can't fight with all this, he said. I'm not used to it. He took it off. He took it off. And then verse number 40 says, he took his shepherd's stick and then picked up five smooth stones from the stream. Smooth stones from the stream and put them in his bag. With his sling ready, he went out to meet Goliath. Verse number 49, he reached into his bag and took out a stone which he slung at Goliath. See, Goliath was protected everywhere except the face. It hit him on the forehead and broke his skull. Goliath fell face downward to the ground. Verse number 50. Verse number 50. Without a sword, David defeated and killed Goliath with a sling and a stone. Hey, come on. Hey, come on. Yeah. See, this, is, this is God's record, no? This is God's record. Whenever a person has trusted him, see, see the record of God. There's a furious fight for the control of your forehead. You know what your forehead is? It is the seat of intelligence and the seat of reasoning. The devil is fighting for it. And he's using the weapon of fear. So that you do whatever you want to do. And God is fighting and saying, look at my track record and believe in me, trust in me. The furious fight for the control of the mind. Do you understand that? Do you understand why the devil is after our head? Do you understand now why she asked for the head of John the Baptist? Herod's wife, Herodias, she could have simply said, kill John the Baptist. He said, I want his head on a platter. Do you know the devil wants your head? He wants to control the way you think. He wants your mind. And look at what David did. David smashed the way of thinking. With that one stone, he smashed the forehead. That's what God is telling you. Change your way of thinking. Smash that way of thinking, which the devil wants you to think. And so this is the second story. Put it there. The lesson about David and Goliath. Earlier, show them the earlier one. The lesson about King Josephus. Now the lesson about David and Goliath. Let's go on. Let's go on. Now I'm going to show you the lesson about King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a good king. Now I want to show you this story particularly because, you know, this was a story in which the, it shows us how much the devil tries to influence your way of thinking. So the enemy who had attacked him actually sent people to make propaganda. They would go on the road and they would speak to the Israelites and tell them, but your king is going to help you. Not even God can help you. Uh, this is the common talk today. When I look around in the COVID situation and I see even people saying, not even God can help. I remember what happened to King Hezekiah. And I beg you today to see the similarities. That's why we go to Isaiah chapter 36, verse number one. In the 14th year that Hezekiah was king of Judah, Sennacherib, the emperor of Assyria, attacked the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. This is a historical fact. If you check up in your history books, in school or college, you will see that there was a character known as Hezekiah, and Sennacherib was the emperor of Assyria who attacked him. Okay, I'll show them verse number two. Then he ordered his chief official to go from Lachish to Jerusalem with a large military force to demand that King Hezekiah should surrender. And see what the official did. The official occupied the road where the cloth makers work, by the ditch that brings water from the upper pools. See, he stood there because he knows that people are going to come there to drink water. So he's going to make his propaganda from there. Look at the way the devil operates. No? Where the people are... Um, come the most, there he starts his propaganda. Okay, verse number four. The Assyrian official told them, the emperor wanted to know what made King Hezekiah so confident. Verse number five. He demanded, look at this, look at this. Do you think that words can take the place of military skill and might? Who do you think will help you rebel against Assyria? See the way. Further, six. You are expecting Egypt to help you? 
that that will be like using a reed against a walking stick. It would break and would jab your hand. That is what the king of Egypt is like when anyone relies on him. Verse number seven. The Syrian official went on. Oh, will you tell me you are relying on the Lord? Your God? Are it was the whole, the Lord's shrines and altars that Hezekiah destroyed when he told the people of Judah and Jerusalem to worship at one altar. So, he also tries to remind you of your past, your sinful past. The devil's job is to drag the garbage of your past before you and say, because of this, you will get punishment. See? And this whole thing, you know, gives a whole idea of the way the devil tries to influence our mind. Verse number eight. I will make a bargain with you in the name of the emperor. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many riders, which means there are no people with you also. And uh, again, verse number nine. You are no match for even the lowest ranking Assyrian official, yet you expect the Egyptians to send you chariots and horsemen. Verse number 10. Do you think I have attacked your country and destroyed it without the Lord's help? Wow, look at this. Look at this tactic. Huh? He says, do you think we could reach this much if the Lord was not with us? So can you see the devil's attempt? He will remind you of your past sins. He will tell you you're powerless. No one will be able to help you. He'll even say that God is with them. The Lord himself told me to attack it and destroy it. Look at that. Verse number 13, 1, 3. Then the officials stood up and shouted in Hebrew. This is important. Underline this word in Hebrew. Huh? Why? He realized Hebrew can be understood by the people. Just as go and understand Konkani. Till now he was talking English. Now he starts talking Konkani. So that maximum people can be demoralized and discouraged. And he said, listen to what the emperor of Assyria is telling you. Go on, verse number 14. He warns you not to let Hezekiah deceive you. Hezekiah cannot save you. 15. Don't let him persuade you to rely on the Lord. Don't think the Lord will save you and that he will stop our Assyrian army from capturing your city. 16. Don't listen to Hezekiah. The emperor of Assyria commands you, come out of the city and surrender. That's what the devil wants us to surrender to the fear of COVID. Surrender to fear of various problems we have. You will all be allowed to eat grapes from your own vines and figs, from your own trees and drink water, etc., 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 etc. Verse number 18. Don't let Hezekiah fool you into thinking the Lord will rescue you. Did the gods of any other nation save their countries from the emperor of Assyria? I'm taking this time, you know, to take you into the detailed dialogue of this man, or rather monologue. He was trying to break into their forehead, break into their brain and tell them it's finished. Nothing can be done. And this is what people think. Huh? Now people are pinning their hope on the vaccine, vaccine. If for one instance, suddenly something wrong is found in a vaccine, their hopes will be crushed completely. Or if it is found that a vaccine is in the long-term counterproductive, finished. No? That's why your reliance should always be on the word of God. He saves. Right? And further, now he has put it in writing. I am told, in verse number 20. When did any of the gods of these countries ever save their country from my emperor? What makes you think the Lord can save Jerusalem? 21. The people kept quiet. Just as King Hezekiah told them to, they did not say a word. So they just kept quiet. But anyway, you know, whatever you're listening, that's why I told you, these days we are being bombarded by the TV, by this, by that, by the news, friends, relatives. Listen to them, but don't allow that to influence your thought. Your rock is the word of God. And Jesus said, whoever builds his house on rock, yes, the breeze will come. Yes, the flood will come. Yes, the water will hit that house, but it will not collapse. But whoever builds it on sand, the flood will come. It will take with it the, your house which is built on sand. 
let it be built on the rock of the word of God. Isaiah chapter 37. Now he wants to frighten the king. So chapter 37, verse number 5, he sends a letter to King Hezekiah. When Isaiah received King Hezekiah's message, he sent back this answer. The Lord tells you, do not let the Assyrians frighten you. By their claims, he cannot save you. He sent a letter to King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was afraid, and he contacted a man of God, Isaiah. And Isaiah sends him this answer, don't be afraid. Don't listen to that rot that the Lord cannot save you. Verse number seven. The Lord will cause the emperor to hear a rumor that will make him go back to his own country, and the Lord will have him killed there. And so further, verse number 14. King Hezekiah took the letter from the messengers. He read it. Now look at it. Look at this. He went to the temple and placed the letter there in the presence of the Lord. No. He took the letter and went and gave it there. Makes me remember many years back when someone came almost at midnight to my house with a problem and says, we have written out the problem, brother, so that you will not forget. In the middle of the night. And I said, okay, I'll pray for it. And after they had left, I folded that letter after reading it put it in an envelope, and I put it under the statue of Our Lady of Naju. I said, Mother, my prayers are inadequate, but your prayers are powerful. You settle this. It was a dangerous problem, involving almost the threat to murder, because one of their children had run away with someone else, etc. And there it remained, and Our Lady's statue. And just next to Our Lady's statue is the, the image of our Lord. There it remained in their safe custody. I stopped even praying for it. Must have prayed for two days, stopped. Then at the end of the year, when I was, means many months later, eight months later, I was clearing the house, you know. I happened to take up the statue to wipe it and clean it. And down I found this letter. I said, I opened it and I saw the phone number given there. I said, I wonder what has happened. So I rang up and I asked, hey, is it you? Remember, you had come to my place. What has happened? Oh, brother, we are so thankful to you. Everything was solved in a good way and this and that. I said, uh, how long it took to resolve this? He said, within less than a month, things settled down. I said to him, I said, did you thank the Lord? I know you have not thanked me. I don't want your thanks. But did you thank the Lord at least? Because I by chance found your letter. So, you see, human beings are like that. Huh? Ten lepers were healed, the Lord said. Why is it that only one has come back? You understand, no human nature. Huh? King Hezekiah took the letter. He went to the temple, placed the letter in the presence of the Lord. And verse number 17. Now, Lord, hear us and look at what is happening to us. Listen to all the things that Shana Cherib is saying to insult you, the living God. It's important that even the apostles said the same thing later on. When they were threatened after Jesus had ascended into heaven, in Acts chapter 4, read sometimes, they said, Lord, take note of whatever they have said. You take note and see what they have said. And Lord, give us the strength to keep on proclaiming your word. And the whole place was filled with the Holy Spirit because they were praying for the right thing. It's important in this COVID situation also, we should be able to pray for the right thing. Lord, fill us with your faith. Take note of the sickness. Take note of the lives it has taken. Take note even of my fears. But Lord, enable me to do what you want me to do. Enable me to reach out to as many people as possible. Enable me, Lord, to tell them that the real root of the problem is to repent, to come back to you. Enable me to explain to them your ways. Let your prayer be like this, and you'll see the Holy Spirit helping them. Verse number 20. 
Now, Lord, rescue us from the Assyrians so that all the nations of the world will know that you alone are God. Now, I want to show you, after all this, what happens. Go straight to verse number 33. This is what the Lord has said about the Assyrian emperor. He will not enter this city or shoot a single arrow against it. No soldiers with shields will come near the city. No siege mounds to be built around it. Isaiah is conveying the message. Continue. He will go back by the same road he came without entering the city. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse number 35. I will defend the city and protect it for the sake of my own honor and because of the promise I made to my servant David. Verse number 36. An angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 1,85,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay all dead. In history books, you will find that when he was besieging King Hezekiah, a strange sickness came over his soldiers and thousands of his soldiers died. The Bible tells the truth. An angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000. There they lay all dead. Verse number 37. The Assyrian emperor withdrew and he returned to Nineveh. And finally, they take us to verse number 38. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, two of his sons killed him with their swords and then escaped to the land of Ararat. Another of his sons succeeded in him as emperor. That's the end of him. That is the end of him. What is the use of all those threats? So remember, dear friends, in this period when you are being bombarded by all this, no, do not allow the devil to take control of your thinking process. You'll be filled with fear. I know all that, but I don't want to be concerned about it. Because I believe in what my God has said. You understand? So there you have the example, the lesson of King Ezekiel. There's so many lessons, so many incidents. St. Paul will later write to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, he will write 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All this is written for your sake so that you may know what has happened. See, all this is written in the Bible so that you may know this God and how he operates. All this is written because of that so that you know how that God operates. And from that you should get courage. No? But what is our case? What is our case, dear friend? We forget easily. We forget. Just as Psalm 106 says, 106, verse number 13, they quickly forgot what he had done and acted without his advice. Put a red line around quickly forgot. This is our case. We quickly forget what God has done. We quickly forget it. And we act without waiting for his advice. This is where we blunder. You understand now? We quickly forget. Even when Jesus came on several occasions, Jesus gave them gentle scolding. He gave them, he gives us gentle scolding. He told the two who were walking to him house, he said, how foolish, how slow you are to believe whatever I've told you. No? Whatever is written in the Bible, how slow you are to believe it. Luke chapter 24, verse number 25. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. How slow you are to believe everything the prophet said. How foolish, how slow. This is gentle scolding of our Lord. Today also he scolds us. How could you get so frightened? The others are getting frightened. They are not my people, but you are my people. You know me. The angel said it at the birth of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. Peace to his people on earth. Look at that. The people of God are in peace. And they work and they live for the glory of God. Glory to God in the highest. First sentence, second sentence. And peace to his people on earth. So when we don't believe, uh, we may go prayer meetings, retreats, but it's not having any effect on us, you know. Uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse number 14. Look out. 
another gentle scolding by the Lord. And Jesus scolded them for not believing sufficiently. And that's what the Lord does to me, to you. Often he does it to me. He scolds me. He says, Edmund, you don't believe I can do this? Huh? Because I remember years back once when I was praying over someone. Something in the back of my mind was saying, you better not pray because nothing will happen and people will laugh at you and this and that. Now I know who's at, whose voice was speaking. The one who didn't want me to exercise faith. No. But I refused to listen and I prayed. In the name of Jesus I prayed. And nothing happened. But that evening I received a phone call that the person was healed. And that really strengthened my faith. Today I'm showing you that the Lord scolds us. See, later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. See? Lack of faith and stubborn refusal. Because we have minds only of this earth, we cannot believe. No wonder St. Paul says, fix your minds and your eyes on things which are there. Like that uh, sister. You show me that picture of that sister. I, I somehow like that picture on her deathbed. Look at that, man. On her deathbed. Look at this. It's all coming to us, you know. One day or the other, we are going to go. But where is your faith? Why the fear about death? Huh? Never fear death, remember. Never. Some people fear death because of various reasons. Whom we are going to leave back here. And my darling wife, my darling children, I will leave. You are not always going to be here. For your kind information, the very room in which your funeral is held, after six months there will be birthday parties there. So don't think you will be missed so much. Bishop Fulton Sheen said, Pride, pride ends six months after you die. Six months after you die, pride ends. Why did he say that? He should have said, pride dies when you die. Six months, because even when we die, we have, before we die, we have imagination. How many people are going to come for a funeral? Whole church will be packed, and this and that. And even... Even later at the cemetery, oh, it will be crowded. By the way, COVID pandemic has already ruined that. <laughs> Very few people are going to come for a funeral. And Bishop was right when he said, your pride dies after six months, because after six months, no one is even going to think about you. Not even your beloved husband or wife. Think, think, think. For what are you living? Wherever your place, become a model. So that people believe because of your faith. They believe. No? Never fear death. Please put that. Never fear death. It's not death that a man should fear. But always remember I told you this. Fear if you have not begun to live for Christ. Fear then. No? And repent. Repent. Tell Jesus from your heart you're sorry and ask him by means of the Holy Spirit to change your life. Because only the Holy Spirit can enable you to live for Christ. The Holy Spirit can set you on fire for Christ. No? Irrespective of anything. You will be looking the same person. But within you there's a fire for Christ. Those are true Christians. Therefore if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, it does you no good. You may be a very good cook, I tell you so many times. You may be a good cook, but if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to help you. You have the power of cooking, but do you have the power of the Holy Spirit? You may be a good teacher. You have the power of teaching, but do you have the power of the Holy Spirit? You may be a very loving person. Cats and dogs are also very loving. Have you heard of any cat or dog being canonized and becoming a saint, reaching heaven? Have you? Someone may say, I'm very hardworking. Yes, donkeys are also hardworking. But donkeys don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why they cannot go to heaven. But when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you day and night, you'll be burning for the Lord inside. 
Otherwise, only outwardly for a little while, for one, two years, and then you will go back to living for the world. And the bigger shock awaits you. Many people, I always say, are going to be stunned. On the day of judgment, they're going to get the biggest shock of their life. When they say, Lord, Lord, in your name we do this. Lord, Lord, we to preach, we to work miracles. Lord, Lord, I gave online retreats. Edmund, did you do what my father wanted you to do? Did you give your heart totally to me and live for me? Get away from me. No, that's why it is not that that a man should fear. Fear never beginning to live for Jesus Christ. I don't know why, but the Lord seems to have led me into this. Today again, I think one more person I had to counsel again on that bed. This time it was an elderly man on that bed. Huh? And the day before the boy, there I was called to just pray by a non-Christian family. So sitting in the place I'm sitting, with God's grace, I'm reaching out to those who are on the verge of going the other side. No? And I'm happy. Because to the non-Christian, I could tell the non-Christian about that beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ. To the boy, I could introduce him to what is real Christianity and living for Christ. To the old man who has had everything in life, I've shown him what has been missing in his life. You understand? No. We need to save them. A man on us on a sinking ship does not require a compost tablet, does not require a tablet to put him to sleep. A man on a sinking ship has to be saved. And that is what God wants of us. Become instruments to save. Stop the flow of souls to hell. Because Jesus came to save. And if you say you love Jesus, please, like me, ask for the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit will set you on fire. Otherwise, you'll be living for your child, for your wife, husband, house, home, family, future, business, etc., etc. That is what the Lord meant. He said, you search the scriptures and study them, but you're not willing to come to me. For whom are you living? What are you living? Fear if you have never begun to live for Jesus Christ. I want to take this song particularly. Listen to this song. The song is like this. It is you speak to yourself. And I encourage you. Whenever you're fearful, speak to your own soul. Why are you afraid? Don't you know God has always been on your side? His track record has been seen. Show, the, show them the track record. King Jehoshaphat. Show them another one. David and Goliath, show them another one. Hezekiah, Jehoshaphat, King Asa, so many. And the biggest lesson, the lesson about Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that we should not perish. Believe and live for him. Please don't be irreligious people who hold on to the outward form of religion and are quite happy with it. No, don't be like that. The words of the song are like this. Show them the song. O oh my soul, do you not know? Have you not heard? From the beginning it has been told, the Lord or your God is on your side. O oh my soul, don't be afraid. Hope in the Lord. By his righteousness and power, he will strengthen, he will guide. I will soar on wings like eagles, held by the hand of God. I will run and not grow tired when in his name I call. Play the song for us. He will 
Patiently, I'll wait. 